off in the last class, uh, we had been talking a little bit about the rampant anti-Semitism in Europe uh, at this time and how that feeds into uh, human responses to the plague here. So the Jews tended to get the brunt of the blow when it came to finding a scapegoat for the plague. And, um, and then this was something that was perpetuated by the fact that Jewish communities were slightly less likely uh, to suffer from the plague because of um, kosher rules. So kosher law uh, and rules about sanitation and cleanliness. So generally speaking, some of these Jewish towns uh, tended to be a little bit cleaner. So they're less likely to get the plague but that makes people more suspicious of them. And so we start hearing all of these conspiracy theories about Jews poisoning the wells, that they're going around poisoning the wells, getting all of these uh, Christians sick. And, um, and so this was something that was even perpetuated further by the fact that they would bring Jews in and torture them and question them about whether they poisoned the wells. And when it comes to medieval torture techniques and uh, questioning here, the, uh, the uh, people who were doing the torturing and the questioning often had a narrative that was already preset and they basically torture them until they say what the person wants them to say. And so you end up with a lot of false uh, or false confessions about poisoning the wells, which again, perpetuates all of this. And so generally speaking, this reaction to uh, persecuting Jews was a bottom up phenomenon. So we're talking about everyday people who are often persecuting Jews as a response. It was generally speaking, not um, an institutional problem, at least at this time. So we have evidence that local governments would actually step up and try to protect Jews and try to convince people that, hey, it's, it's not them, it's not their fault, please calm down, please don't kill your Jewish neighbors. Uh, we also see the Pope himself stepping in and condemning all of the violence against Jews and trying to convince people that it's not them, please stop killing Jews. And so, um, so again, typically everyday people who are doing this and not necessarily church or government establishments. There are some exceptions here and there, but for the most part, uh, it's kind of everyday people here. And so um, in addition to blaming uh, other people for this, we also have uh, some medical explanations for what's going on with the plague, because we have to keep in mind here that, of course, people living in the Middle Ages have no idea what bacteria is, all right? They are fighting this blindfolded, um, and so they have to make the best guesses that they possibly can, given the technology that they have at the time. And so one of the most uh, prevailing uh, theories about the Black Death was that it was caused by miasma. And we've talked about this briefly in a previous session here, but the theory about miasma was that uh, it's essentially bad air, bad air that wafts up from battlefields that are strewn with dead bodies or from swamps um, or any other putrid place. And that this air, this stench, would just form these uh, dense clouds that would then uh, waft over uh, one town after another. And um, this might seem like a bit of a stretch, of course, from a modern perspective, we know they're wrong about this, but we have to keep in mind that there were some doctors at the time that said miasma could actually inhabit uh, sick people's lungs. And that when that person breathed or coughed or sneezed, uh, they could spread the miasma to other people. And so we're starting to get an idea that they're thinking this could be spread from person to person. And we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, in, a, in a little bit. And, um, and so in order to get rid of the miasma, they encourage people to light fires to burn off all of that bad air. That's why the Pope uh, was in his palace at Avignon with bonfires all around him. And even though we know that this isn't really effective, of course, to burn off all of the bad air, it could actually serve a um, pragmatic purpose here of burning uh, or rather fumigating 
uh, your house or palace or what have you, and, um, and reducing the number of fleas. So that is something that could be beneficial, even if their reasoning behind it um, was a little bit off. And so, um, so now, uh, when it comes to fighting this bad air, in addition to lighting bonfires, you could also fight it by wearing a mask like the one that you see uh, in on the slide there. So that horrible looking mask right there would have been a plague doctor's mask. And the reason that it has that awful looking beak on it is because they thought that if you stuffed the beak full of herbs and good smelling flowers and things like that, that it could help filter uh, the miasma. And so um, we know that, of course, this isn't uh, the same grade of PPE that we might have now for a hazmat suit, but it's at least a start. Um, so it could potentially uh, help prevent people from getting pneumonic plague, which we're gonna be talking about uh, in a bit. And so, um, so they would wear this mask, they would wear long robes, they would tuck all of their, uh, they would tuck their pants into their shirt, they would tuck their shirt into their gloves, all of this to keep all of that bad air out. But it also had the added bonus of keeping them from getting bitten by fleas. And so it worked, just not for the reasons that they thought that it was working. And, um, and so, uh, it, even everyday people would try to carry around uh, flowers and herbs and things like that. They would just have a little bushel of them and then take a whiff of it to try to inoculate themselves uh, against the plague. And um, of course, that's where we may or may not get the ring around the rosies, pocket full of posies uh, nursery rhyme there. And, um, and so some of the more rational uh, writers at the time, including Giovanni Boccaccio, uh, mentioned that these little pockets full of posies, they don't actually do any good at fighting the plague, but he assumes that people keep them around because they're comforting, all right? It's comforting when you see all of this death destruction, you smell all of these horrible smells all around you. It's kind of nice to have a little bouquet of flowers with you. And, um, and so they're fighting off the bad air uh, with flowers. They also um, have a number of medical theories to go along with all of this, including uh, theories that are associated with the four humors theory, which we may have mentioned in passing in a previous class here. But there's this idea that your body is made up of four humors and um, you have blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And in order to be healthy and happy, they all have to be in balance with one another. And so if you come down with the plague, clearly your humors are not balanced. So you need to do something about that. And one of the things that they suggest doing is having your blood lead. And so they'd go into the doctor, they would cut them open, and they would let a goodly amount of blood out. And if you're wondering what a goodly amount of blood means, um, there was one plague doctor that bragged about taking eight pounds of blood out of someone's body. And if you're thinking, hmm, that does not sound healthy, taking eight pounds of blood out of someone's body, you're right. Uh, that's definitely not healthy at all. And um, in fact, medieval doctors thought that if you didn't at least pass out, that they clearly weren't taking enough blood from you. And they believed that it was even more detrimental to take too little blood, because if you don't take enough, then your blood would just recirculate and the poison would go back to your heart. So you have to take plenty of blood out in order for it to do any good. And um, so bloodletting is a mixed bag here because Clearly, they can weaken people who perhaps could have fought off the plague if they hadn't had their blood taken. Um, and they can introduce new infections by cutting people open. So that's a huge problem as well. But um, bizarrely enough, bloodletting could actually work sometimes. It depends on when you do it. So if you do it at the first onset of a bacterial infection, 
it can actually help because when you uh, induce anemia and you have an iron deficiency in your blood, it can actually inhibit uh, bacterial growth. And some people got better after they had their blood let. And so that's why they keep doing it because occasionally it seems like it's working. And, um, and so, uh, another problem that we run into with this bloodletting and one of their other methods for treating uh, the plague, which was poking and prodding at buboes, uh, which is what you're seeing in the picture at the bottom uh, on the right there. Uh, so what they would do is let's just say that you are a medieval woman with a family and you've come down with the plague and you need to go to the doctor. It was customary for you to bring your whole family to the doctor with you just in case. Even if your kids aren't showing any symptoms, you bring everybody just in case the doctor needs to uh, give them some sort of preventative care. And the doctor would see you and your family and say, all right, well, you are the worst off, so you need to be treated first. And um, they might bring out their scalpel and start lancing your buboes. And that's just as awful as you think it is. So they lance these buboes and basically let out all of this bacteria. And after they've done that to the mother, they might say, well, your kids aren't showing any symptoms, but just in case, probably a good idea if we let out some of their blood. So they take that same knife that they just used to lance her buboes and they cut her kids open with it to uh, do bloodletting. And this is something that can introduce septicemic plague, which we'll be talking about later as well. And, um, and so if you're lucky, you might've gone to a doctor who sterilized their equipment. Um, they did, uh, some doctors did uh, dip their equipment into vinegar in order to kill some of the bacteria. They didn't know what they were doing, but they thought that vinegar could clean it. They would not only clean their instruments with vinegar, but they would clean their hands with vinegar as well. But this is another case where medieval people are doing the right thing, but for the wrong reasons. So they thought that vinegar had such a strong smell that it could fight miasma. And and so you're basically cleaning off all of the miasma from your tools. And when you clean your hands with it, they suggested that you take your hands, put them up to your face and take a big whiff of all of that vinegar so that it can go into your lungs and fight all of the miasma. So again, doing the right thing, but for the wrong reasons here. And that's if you're lucky enough to go to a doctor who actually cleans their, uh, their equipment with that. And that being said, vinegar can help, but it's not strong enough to fully sanitize uh, equipment. So it's better than nothing, but it doesn't fully do the job. So generally speaking, if you go to the doctor, you're probably going to die. So in addition to some of these uh, preventative uh, or preventative measures and treatments here, they also had some suggestions for what you should do at home uh, if you come down with the plague. So for starters, you shouldn't sleep for three days, all right? Don't sleep for three days. And the reason they thought this is because the plague is something dark and nefarious, and it tends to work better at night. So when you go to sleep, you're basically allowing the plague to run rampant throughout your body. But if you stay awake, then um, you'll be fine. And so they suggest that they don't sleep. They also suggest that they don't exercise because that will help to move the plague throughout your body. And um, don't eat any fruit or vegetables either because medieval people thought fruits and vegetables were bad for you. They're bad for your humors. Uh, they upset your system. They can cause digestive issues and all sorts of things. So you better avoid all of those unhealthy fruits and vegetables as well. So these are the things that people are being told to do when they go home with the plague. And um, we also have some examples of more eye of mute types of remedies here where they uh, tell them to uh, crush up snails and, uh, and eat those. Uh, or make an elixir out of chicken anuses. We don't know why they did that. We have no clue why they thought this was effective, but it was an alleged 
remedy here, along with uh, consuming unicorn horns. And if you're wondering where they got their supply of unicorn horns, um, people in the Middle Ages, one, firmly believed that unicorns were real, uh, and two, they thought this because they could get what looked like unicorn horns, uh, mostly from fishers who are fishing in the north there uh, and catching narwhals. So they, they have the little horn there that looks like a unicorn horn, and people would pass it off at market as, as just that. So they thought that they could cure the plague uh, with those. And then you also have things like amulets and plague rings, spells and incantations, things like that to try to prevent it. But of course, none of these are terribly effective here. Um, they did have some more familiar remedies, though, that were a little bit more effective or at least not harmful. So they suggested chicken soup. All right. So something that we can all relate to. We, we hear this to this day. If you get the flu or a cold, you're supposed to sit down and have a nice bowl of chicken soup. And people in the Middle Ages um, thought you should do that too, that it could potentially help with the plague. And um, they also suggested uh, maintaining a positive attitude, that the more positive you were, the more likely it was that you were going to be able to fight the plague. And that's true too. So when you keep up your morale, um, you are more likely to recover from this. They also had herbal remedies like St. John's wort and camphor, aloe, um, and even opium syrup. And um, so none of these would cure the plague, but they could potentially make you more comfortable um, while you had it. So those are some of the more effective remedies that they have for this. But for the most part, they don't have a good way of treating this because they don't know what they're treating, all right? So just completely blindfolded here. And um, so now to talk about what's actually going on. So what is the plague? Uh, and the real explanation, of course, is that the plague was likely Yersinia pestis bacteria. Okay, so Yersinia pestis bacteria. And I say likely because um, it is up for debate here. We'll get into why that is momentarily. But if we're going uh, with the idea that it's Yersinia pestis bacteria, what would happen is that this bacteria uh, was typically endemic to um, burrowing rodents. So examples like the marmot that we talked about in a previous presentation, uh, and, and throughout most of Europe, it was endemic to black rats, and it's very specific to black rats. And we'll get into the importance of that later as well. And, um, and so this bacteria, when the fleas would feed on it, uh, it would enter into their systems and it would uh, cause their uh, capillaries to clog up and it would cause them to produce an enzyme that coagulated the blood meal that they were taking in and it blocked up their entire system. You can actually see that on this slide here with that flea um, with the cloudiness inside it. That's where everything has gotten blocked up and congealed. And that's really important, as gross as it sounds. That's really important because um, when all of this gets blocked up, the flea can't take in more nutrients. And so it feels like it's starving. And so it becomes ravenous and aggressive. And it just keeps biting and biting and biting and biting, trying its best to get in more nutrients because everything's all blocked up. And it also causes fleas to vomit. And so they're aggressively biting and then vomiting up this bacteria blood meal straight into people's wounds. And so it's a perfect situation for inoculating people with plague bacteria. And so usually once you come down uh, or once you're bitten by this flea here, you would start to come down with flu-like symptoms within maybe two to seven days or so. So the first symptoms that you would experience were things like high fever or headaches um, and body stiffness, chills, and uh, it might be accompanied with nausea, vomiting, and constipation, sensitivity to light, all sorts of other 
uh, symptoms as well, which is why it's kind of hard to nail down exactly what this was. But those were usually the first symptoms that you would experience. But as those symptoms progressed, um, you would then start to develop little rings around your lymph nodes. And usually it hit the lymph nodes that were closest to the flea bite first. So if you were bitten on your leg, then you might start to see the lymph nodes in your groin area, uh, getting the, uh, the little rings around them. If you're bitten on your head or face or something like that, your lymph nodes uh, on your neck would start to develop those first. And it would start out as a ring, um, hence the ring around the rosy. Uh, it would start off as a ring and then it would start to grow into a fully fledged bubo, uh, which would have been full of bacteria and all kinds of other nasty junk. And um, as that bubo started to grow, it would eventually burst. And usually at that point, people die. Okay, usually people tend to die, especially if their buboes start to burst. And in fact, somewhere between 60 to 90% of the people who came down with bubonic plague uh, ended up dying. And, but this is nothing in comparison to another form of plague, which is pneumonic plague. And as you could probably gather, pneumonic plague is when the plague bacteria enters into your lungs. So airborne droplets could be coughed or sneezed out by an infected person and then breathed in by someone else. And that takes the animal out of the equation and turns the plague into something that is spread person to person here. And um, our medieval sources tell us that when people came down with this type of plague, they would start coughing up bloody sputum, basically. Uh, they'd have rapid, painful breathing. And um, these symptoms would also go along with some of the other symptoms of bubonic plague, the flu-like symptoms. And, um, and so eventually they would end up dying. And I say they would end up dying with relative certainty. So for medieval people who came down with the uh, pneumonic plague, it had a hundred percent death rate, okay? If you got pneumonic plague, you were going to die and you are going to die a terrible, terrible death. So if you're thinking, well, at least these people with pneumonic plague don't get buboes that end up bursting and all that, that sounds horrible. But the people with pneumonic plague tend to come down with a very viscous pneumonia. And our medieval sources tell us that they would die gasping for air and suffering from what they called air starvation. And so it was a really, really bad way to go. So 100% death rate. Even today, when people come down with pneumonic plague, and we have antibiotics to treat the plague, they still usually end up dying. So it's, it's that deadly. And, um, and so we have pneumonic plague. And we also have another form of plague. So it, it likes to, I don't know, be varied here. You can't just have it in one form. There's also septicemic plague. And septicemic plague was the form of plague that was often spread by doctors uh, in that scenario that I'd mentioned before, where they are lancing buboes and then taking that same knife and sticking it into someone else and basically putting this plague bacteria directly into their bloodstream. And with septicemic plague, people often died so quickly that they didn't have any symptoms. So you get it and you're dead within 24 hours and people almost don't even know what happened to you. And um, if you don't die within 24 hours of sep uh, getting septicemic plague, you kind of wish you had because then it gets really, really nasty there. So people experience things like subcutaneous bleeding or bleeding out of orifices and all sorts of awful stuff that we might uh, associate with a hemorrhagic virus like, uh, like Ebola. So it's a bad way to go. And similar to pneumonic plague, septicemic plague in the Middle Ages had a 100% death rate. Uh, so you get it, you're absolutely a goner. So these are the three uh, manifestations of Yersinia pestis. Um, but there are some historians and epidemiologists that think that it either wasn't Yersinia pestis or it wasn't just Yersinia pestis. And the reason that people think this is because of how quickly the plague spread. And it was pretty 
common for the plague to spread somewhere between four and 20 miles per year among rodent populations. It's very slow moving, but when the plague breaks out uh, in the 1340s here, it spreads about five miles a day. And so the rapid spread just does not make sense with how, uh, how the plague virus typically spreads among these rodents here. And there's also the issue that uh, if you come down with the plague, especially if you come down with say pneumonic plague or septicemic plague, you're not gonna be traveling five miles to the next uh, to the next village or something like that. You're gonna be bedridden. So they don't really know how it spread so quickly because the population density in Europe was not such that it could spread from one village to another, to another, to another rapidly. So there have been a number of other uh, guesses about what this was or what it was combined with. And um, one of the most common assumptions about this is that it could have been the plague bacteria and anthrax at the same time. And the reason that uh, they're going with anthrax is because of some of the descriptions of the symptoms that don't line up with plague symptoms. So for example, the chronicler uh, and writer Giovanni Boccaccio mentions that people in Italy were coming down with gavicioli. And those are not bubos. They look more like freckly dots on your face and the rest of your body as well. And um, that's more symptomatic of anthrax. And so they're thinking that it could have been a combination of diseases, perhaps anthrax or perhaps some other kind of hemorrhagic virus, again, like Ebola, and that it was kind of a one-two punch. And so, um, so that's a possibility. I'm inclined to believe that at least one of these, uh, these diseases was Yersinia pestis because they found evidence for a predecessor to that bacteria in the tooth pulp of uh, plague victims. So we're thinking it's at least one of the issues that they're experiencing at this time. And so now um, to talk a little bit about what happens next? Or was it all that bad? So how serious was the plague here? And um, so we can see that people like Petrarch here lived through the Black Death and lost all of their loved ones. In fact, if you've ever read Petrarchan sonnets, he often writes about this woman named Laura and Laura died of the plague and Petrarch was just absolutely distraught afterward. But it's not just Laura, it's everyone around him. In fact, Petrarch feels like he is experiencing the apocalypse right now. And um, as you can see on the slide there, he says that is it possible that posterity can believe these things? For we who have seen them can hardly believe them. And he mentions that he is living in Avignon at the time and he walks out of his door into this formerly bustling city. So Avignon would have been like walking out into the middle of New York or London or something. He walks out and he is overwhelmed by silence. It's just totally quiet. There is no one there. He's the only one. And um, that just gives you the creeps. And it kind of makes me think of that movie with Will Smith, I Am Legends, uh, if anyone has seen that, where he goes into the middle of New York City after this uh, viral outbreak has just decimated the human population. And he sees overgrown streets there and wildlife walking across them and he's the only person there. That's kind of how Petrarch felt in the middle of the plague. And, um, and so our chroniclers like Petrarch, um, like the chroniclers from China as well, and some of them even in the Middle East, mention um, that the plague was particularly devastating, having killed nine out of 10 people. I mentioned in the previous class that we kind of questioned the Chinese sources that would say nine out of 10 people in a village died, but then the European sources said the exact same thing. And there could be an, an interesting explanation for all of this. So we're pretty sure that these chroniclers are exaggerating at least a little bit. And we have some evidence to, uh, to corroborate all of that. So for example, in Florence, um, the chronicler Boccaccio mentions that the plague had killed about 100 
thousand people. The problem with that is that at that time, there were only about 90 to maybe 120,000 people living in Florence in the first place. So the odds of it killing 100,000 people are pretty slim, but the point is it felt like it killed that many people. All right. It felt like everybody around you was dying. And um, and so and when we're talking about the actual numbers here, the fraction that always gets thrown around is one third. So one third of Europeans died during the initial outbreak of the plague. And this fraction is incorrect, okay? It's incorrect, it really downplays the impact of the plague, it doesn't really account for all of the chroniclers' hyperbolic estimates here. And the methodology that the demographer used to come up with this fraction is flawed, and um, you'll be able to see why momentarily. So, uh, so that one-third statistic there comes from a 1948 study by the demographer Josiah Cox Russell, who was looking at post-mortem inquisitions in England. And if you're thinking, I don't know what the heck a post-mortem inquisition is in England, uh, it's, a, it's basically after a wealthy person, a member of the nobility, dies and they pass their estate on to their heirs, they have to file a, um, or a, a post-mortem inquisition has to be filed. So you can use those to track how many members of the nobility are dying. And so um, Russell looks at this and says, okay, well, I've tracked all of these members of the nobility who are dying here, and it looks like about a third of them died during the plague. Problem solved, now we know that a third of all Europeans died during the plague, done, all right? And of course, you're already probably thinking, oh, that can't be accurate here because one, it's only in England. So his study does not cover all of Europe, it's just England. And England was not as hard hit as some of the states around the Mediterranean, especially the ones with major port cities there. So that's a problem in and of itself. The other problem with this stat is that he's only studying members of the nobility and members of the nobility are considerably less likely to die of the plague than everybody else. And um, this is something that we can still see in real time right now, all right? People who are wealthy are less likely to die in pandemics because of a variety of factors. So for starters, they're much less likely to be living in crowded conditions. Um, they have larger estates. They're a little bit more spaced out. Um, they tend to have better access to uh, good food, all right? So they're less likely to suffer from malnutrition. Um, they tend to be cleaner uh, as well. So they have access to sanitation, fresh water sources, all of that. Uh, and so they're just much, much less likely to come down with the plague. And, um, and so he's extrapolating here from uh, how many nobles are dying from the plague in one state in Europe, and then just saying, yep, that's the number for all of Europe. And so it's wrong. And um, we now know exactly how wrong it is, or roughly how wrong it is, I should say because we've had a tidal wave of data that's been painstakingly extracted from sources like bishops registers, uh, at least in the last few years or so. So if you're wondering what a bishops register is, it is um, every church would have had a register of all of the heads of households that, uh, for the attendees. So even though um, they're just registering the heads of households here, it's a little bit better than that original study because you're getting a wider swath of the population and we have bishops registers in practically every European country at this time. So you aren't just focusing on England, you can kind of look at everybody. So if we're looking at these, then the death rate goes up to about 
two thirds, okay? Which is very, very significant, much, much larger than what we had before here. So it goes up to about two thirds, but even that is incredibly conservative. The reason we think that that's conservative is because in these bishops registers, while they're better than those uh, post-mortem inquisitions, they do not count women, children, or serfs. Okay, so that is a huge problem. And it's because women and children were more likely to die of the plague than men were at this time. And if you're wondering, well, why is that? It's because women and children were more likely to be at home indoors than men were at the time. And kids in general tended to have lower immunities to this. So they're not even being counted in this. And then the landless poor and serfs aren't being counted in this either. And they are much more likely to die of the plague than everybody else in society. So even without taking any of these groups into consideration, it still puts it up to about two thirds here. So that's a little bit more accurate, but we may never know uh, exactly how many people died. We may never have an uh, accurate explanation for this because the records just, they just aren't there. And, um, and so now that we've talked a little bit about the death rate and just how bad it may have been here, I want to talk about the impact of this on society. So some of the social impacts here. Um, and so the quote that I have on the slide from Boccaccio is talking about how people are just abandoning each other. All right, they're just abandoning one another. Um, they are treating dead bodies no better than they would treat a dead dog or a goat. Um, it's just everyone out for themselves at the time. And, um, and we see this type of observation repeated um, by one author after another. So we get the impression that this is the norm. It's not just Boccaccio uh, reporting on it. It's kind of the norm at the time. And so, um, the reason that people are acting so callously towards their family members is because one, they're terrified, all right? They're absolutely terrified and thinking that they're living through the apocalypse. And two, they've been told the plague is highly, highly contagious and that they should flee um, from anyone who has come down with it. We now know that bubonic plague specifically wasn't particularly contagious person to person, um, but they didn't know that at the time. So bubonic plague is about as contagious as something like HIV, where um, if you're sitting in the room with someone with HIV, you're not going to get it. Uh, but if you would have to have very special circumstances there where you are exchanging bodily fluids, touching their bodily fluids, getting them into mucous membranes or cuts or something like that, uh, you kind of have to have this perfect storm in order to spread that person to person. And that's similar to how the bubonic plague was. And so they don't know that at the time. So they just flee from the people who are sick, which causes more people to die from the plague. Because if you came down with it, there's nobody there to take care of you, all right? We even hear of mothers abandoning their children or um, just family members just shutting the door and locking people in and saying, don't come out, don't come look for me. Um, so they just, it's no holds barred, like they just abandon everyone. And, um, and the sad thing is that uh, some of these people might have been able to survive if they'd had just a tiny bit of help or assistance here. And we can see that in what happens to wealthier people when they come down with this. Wealthier people were much more likely to have servants and people to take care of them during this and a little bit of palliative care went a long way and that's another reason why wealthy people were less likely to die of the plague and so we see both Boccaccio and the Muslim scholar uh, Ibn Lub in Granada trying to encourage people to take care of the sick rather than flee from them, in part because both of them are saying that God sees how they're treating their fellow man, and there are going to be consequences for this type of behavior. They're also both trying to hang on to the fabric of their communities, which are being destroyed right now, not only by 
by the plague, but by people just leaving in droves. And so Boccaccio in particular saw the moral fabric of his uh, society kind of withering away. And he mentions that in addition to the people who are fleeing from the city, uh, that there are groups of people who just descend into hedonism. So you have kind of the carpe diem people who just say, you know what, it's the end of the world. I'm going to get drunk and I'm just going to do whatever I've always wanted to do. And so he says that they all just stay in taverns all day, just drinking the entire day or going to houses of ill repute and just um, living like there is no tomorrow. Because to be honest, for many of them, there won't be a tomorrow. And so they just figure out oh, what the heck, who cares? And um, they just wanna distract themselves from what's going on around them. And, um, and so if you're thinking here, man, if these people are treating living human beings badly, um, what about the dead? And the dead are treated, of course, even worse here. So as I mentioned, um, dead human beings aren't treated any better than a dead dog or a dead goat. And we see funeral customs starting to change at this time because people just can't keep up with the sheer number of people who are dying. So you hear of people who just toss their family members' dead bodies out into the middle of the street just to get rid of the stench and carts coming by at night to just load up all of the dead bodies like trash just sitting on the side of the road. Um, we hear of wealthy people who are having to pay people to come to their funerals to mourn them, which somehow seems almost sadder that you have to pay somebody to come to your funeral and mourn you. But for everybody else, um, they're just stuck having bodies out in the street, or if they are buried, they're often buried in uh, mass graves. In fact, the Italian chronicler Agnolo mentions that their mass graves would often be like lasagna that they would layer in people, layer in dirt, and then put another layer of people. And yeah, he equates it to lasagna, which is just an awful image there. And so they have mass graves. There are also uh, accounts of them piling up bodies in Constantinople, for example, and um, shipping them off to sea. So they would just grab a load of them, take them out into the middle of the ocean and toss them out at sea. But they couldn't even keep up with all of the bodies. They just started to pile and pile and pile until our sources say that putrefaction leaked into the harbor and actually changed the color of the harbor there in Constantinople because it was just that bad. And so um, to add some much needed comic relief to all of that, if there is any comic relief in this. Um, there are also instances of robbers using all of this to their advantage. They would see a pile of bodies lying in the streets and they would just lay down, close their eyes and just sit there, pretend like they were dead. And then some unsuspecting person would walk by this pile of bodies and the robber would jump up mug them, just completely catch them off guard because no one's expecting a dead body to hop up all of a sudden. And they catch them off guard, rob them, and then run away and head over to the next pile of bodies and do the same thing over and over and over again. So, um, so yeah, people are always willing to take advantage of an awful situation and just use it uh, as best they can. And so now uh, to talk about some of the impacts on the church at this time. So when it comes to the medieval church here, uh, the church was losing lots and lots and lots and lots of laborers, okay, for starters. We have to keep in mind that the church was the single largest landowner in all of Europe during this period. And, um, and the church lost most of the people who were working their land. So we have crops that are going uh, untended to here. We have uh, cathedrals that have no maintenance being done to them, or we have new cathedrals that were in the process of being built, and then they had to just abandon these projects altogether. You can see an example of that on the slide right there. So what you're looking at in the top 
uh, right corner there is, um, is a wing or what would have been a wing of the Duomo in Siena. So they started construction on this, I believe in the 13, uh, 1346 or so. And they got most of the way up with the wall there, but then the plague hit Siena and killed almost everyone in the city and definitely killed all of the workers who were working on this. And so they just had to halt construction completely, just abandon it altogether. And then they never went back to it and finished it afterwards. So if you go to Siena today, uh, then you can actually see this there. You can even walk up onto the wall. You can go up to the very tippy tippy top there and see where they began construction on this wing of the church there, but could never finish it because of the plague. And so we see them, uh, the labor force for the, uh, the church being decimated at this time, but we also see lots of clergy members themselves dying of the plague because we have to keep in mind that the clergy members who are actually doing their job and doing the right thing are going around and tending to the sick, okay? They're tending to the sick. They're saying prayers for them. They are uh, doing last rites for the sick there. And of course, these clergy members are coming down with the plague as well. So that means that after the church loses all of these clergy members, they have to fill in the spots somehow, some way. And so they often end up filling these slots with people who have no idea what they're doing, completely unqualified uh, people. In fact, we hear about, or from our sources there, that some of these people who step up to be clergy members are only qualified insofar as they shave the top of their heads. That's it, all right? So they, they take on the tonsuring and that's it. They have no background in this whatsoever. And these unqualified, uh, newly, uh, or newly hired clergy members there were also known for being really corrupt and basically stepping up to the position so that they could take advantage of it and go around and charge people for prayers and things like that, just making a dime uh, off of the plague and off of other people's suffering. And so this undermines the church's authority and it completely uh, mars the church's reputation. And we can see this uh, their reputation starting to go downhill during the plague. Uh, if we compare uh, two instances of uh, archbishops being killed, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Uh, so if we compare two instances of archbishops being killed and people's reactions to them. So if we go back to the 12th century, you may have heard of uh, Thomas of Becket and how Thomas of Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, was killed by King Henry II's knights. And this was the PR disaster of the day. It's a huge scandal. Um, people all throughout Europe are hearing about this. They are outraged by it. They're calling for Henry to be excommunicated from the church, maybe even executed. Eventually, he has to do really humiliating penance uh, in response to all of this. So again, people are outraged by this uh, archbishop dying. But if we fast forward uh, to the late 14th century and we look at Bishop Simon Sudbury uh, in England there, we hear of a, a mob of peasants attacking him, dragging him to Tower Hill in London and chopping off his head while people laugh and applaud. Okay, so that's something that we typically wouldn't have seen uh, in earlier centuries there, but people really don't have, uh, hold the church in high regard uh, as the plague progresses there. So it's damaging their reputation. It's also paving the way for um, different interpretations of uh, of the religion and um, paving the way for more people to become involved in preaching. In fact, we see this with people like John Wycliffe. So John Wycliffe in England had spoken out against uh, the church commanding total and absolute authority 
uh, over the Christian religion. He thought that uh, all of the masses should be done in people's native languages. They shouldn't be done in Latin. Uh, they should be done in English. Anybody should be able to read the Bible. Uh, anybody should be able to administer sacraments. And that it really wasn't fair. It wasn't right. It wasn't what God intended for the church to have total control over this situation. And so his, um, his philosophy here, his theology started to spread throughout England and the people who followed him are called the Lollards. And the church saw them as being incredibly threatening and um, most of these people were brought into the medieval papal inquisitions and eventually executed. But their beliefs, um, at least two centuries later, kind of paved the way for the Protestant Reformation. So this idea of taking the authority away from the church establishment and putting it into the hands of everyday people, that's something that takes root during the Black Death. And, um, and so now, I'd like to talk about some of the economic effects of the plague and some of the positives to come out of the plague, which it seems kind of strange to think that there are positives uh, coming out of the plague here. But if you lived through it, um, odds are you're going to have a much, much better life after the plague and um, for a couple of reasons here. So to start, um, so many people died during the plague that, of course, there are fields of wheat that had already been sown, but there's no one even there to reap them. Uh, and the people who uh, survive all of this uh, get to kind of step into those positions here. It's basically a buyer's market. There's more money around. There's more livestock. There's more grain per head at this time. We see prices dropping dramatically in the 1350s. We actually have records from England noting that the price of a horse, for example, drops from 40 shillings to 16 shillings or a fat ox, as they said, could be bought for only four shillings, a cow for just one shilling. And we see wheat going from 26 shillings during the famine to um, just one shilling and a quarter at this time. So we can clearly see the price of goods dropping at this time because they have tons and tons of goods and very few people to buy them. And um, on top of that, we have this urgent need for people to actually reap the harvest, uh, which makes landowners um, or encourages landowners to offer higher wages to workers. And um, so in some countries like England, for example, we see uh, reapers and mowers receiving about twice their customary uh, wage for their work. And, um, and we even see the English poet and author William Langland com uh, complaining about that uh, in Pierce Plowman, as you can see there. He says that um, people who had formerly been beggars are now refusing to eat bread with beans and seeds in it, and they demand milk loaves and white uh, wheat bread and uh, the best brown ale, which it's kind of interesting to note here that our tastes have changed so much because now the expensive $8 whole foods bread is the bread that has artisanal grains and little nuts and seeds and junk all in it. And we assume that the darker the bread is, the healthier, the better, the higher quality it is. It was the opposite in the Middle Ages. Nobody wanted to eat the gross bread that had all of the nuts and junk stuck in it. They wanted to eat the finest, most refined bread. They want the whiter the bread, the better, the fewer little seeds and things like that in it, the better. They would have loved Wonder Bread, all right? That would have been a big hit in the Middle Ages. And so Langland here is saying that people who were formerly poor refused to even eat the stuff that they were originally accustomed to eating here, that day laborers uh, would just throw out stale vegetables and demand to be fed uh, things like hot meals of fried fish and uh, fine drinks and things like that. And they uh, not only that, but they said that if their meals weren't hot, they were afraid that their stomachs might catch a chill. So they can make demands. They're in a position to actually demand to be treated better, which is not a position that most uh, peasants had been in ever before. And, um, and so 
we start to see by uh, between 1347 and 1350 that there is a glut of labor and a shortage, uh, or rather there is a glut of uh, labor and a shortage of land there. And, um, and so we see this all throughout uh, Europe. We see this in England at the time in particular, many of our records are coming specifically from England. And there are certain uh, manners that are really hard hit by the plague and they have their whole workforce decimated and then other manors that maybe weren't hit by the plague. And so if you own the manor where you lost your whole workforce, you might send out messages to other manors saying, hey, if you guys come here and abandon your landlord, um, I will pay you more, all right? So it's a better deal here. So we see nobles poaching each other's peasants. And that becomes a huge problem. So much so that in England, we see the, the crown issuing the statute uh, of laborers and um, basically saying that you can't do that. So these peasants are owned essentially by the, the lords. They have feudal ties to them. Uh, and these ties are made for life. You can't just poach somebody's peasants. And it's interesting because prior to the plague, no lord would have taken in a stray peasant there. If you see a new peasant that you don't know and they're coming to your manor wanting to join up, you would just give them the third degree there. You wanna know where they came from, who they belong to, what's going on here. And if you find out that they belong to another Lord, you immediately contact that other Lord and get them sent back there. But that's not the case after the plague. So you take whichever laborers you can get whenever you can get them. And so we see them poaching uh, peasants here. We also see the, uh, the Lords desperately trying to fight against against wage increases, because of course it's affecting their bottom line. They're forced to increase wages, but they don't like having to do that. So they're in a position to petition the crown to do something about it. So we see laws being enacted at this time, which put uh, wages back down to pre-plague rates and prevent them from going up again, they actually make it illegal for peasants to take uh, higher wages or for nobles to offer higher wages, which this is something that, um, that infuriates peasants in particular, because if you have spent your entire life being poor, living in misery, barely having enough to eat, and then for maybe a couple of years there, you actually have enough food to live, your life improves significantly, and then all of a sudden, just one government-issued order here just brings you back down to where you were before. So this undoubtedly eventually leads to peasants' revolts later on uh, in the 14th century. And so in speaking of these peasants who are living slightly better lives, at least in the brief aftermath of the plague there, um, when we think about poor people who suddenly come into money, you can kind of equate that to the modern era. If you see someone from a poor background who suddenly wins the lottery, oftentimes the stereotype is that they don't really know what to do with all of that money. They don't know how to manage that money because they've never had large sums of money before. So what they often do is they buy things that they think make them look rich without having any clue of how to actually be wealthy. So in this day and age, we might hear of people buying really fancy cars and clothes and stuff like that. But in the Middle Ages, they did the exact same thing. All right, the exact same thing. So you would see people who were formerly peasants who buy the nicest horse that they can afford. And they'd get on their fancy horse, they would put rings on every single one of their fingers and have fur-lined capes blowing in the wind there. And just thinking that like they're at the bee's knees, okay? They think that they look awesome, that they are basically convincing everyone around them that they're a member of the nobility. When in actuality, the nobility sees this and they're disgusted by it. All right, they can't stand it. They consider these people to be nouveau riche and they think it's tacky and that it's undermining their uh, established social order. So again, 
rich people petition the crown to do something about it. And they do, they enact sumptuary laws to try to prevent poor people from showing off their wealth. So they would say things like, poor people are only allowed to own this, this, and this type of horse. Or um, if you wear rings only, you can only wear two of them and only one of them can have a precious stone in it. No more fur lined capes and things like that. So they get really particular about it, very petty, just trying to keep people in the class that they were in prior uh, to the plague there. And so speaking of these changes in class structure, I want to show how that uh, plays out in art. And, um, and we can see this particularly in the middle pictures there. So you see the one at the top there in the middle and um, the one at the bottom. So what you're looking at there is this idea that the plague affects everyone and that everyone is equal in death. Okay, everyone is equal in death. It does not matter if that woman at the top there was a very wealthy aristocratic woman with the finest clothing and the finest tomb, which you can see there. If you lift up the tomb and check out her body after she's died, she's a skeleton covered in worms, um, which is what they're showing there. And so death is the great equalizer. And we see this in the bottom picture as well, where you see all of these aristocratic ladies there. And then it shows them on the side that, well, they're skeletons uh, in the afterlife there or skeletons after death. So everybody meets the same end. And so it's something that of course, goes along with the economic changes and the social changes that we're seeing as a result of the plague. Another thing that we're seeing when it comes to art and the plague is people making light of the plague. So you can see this in the picture to uh, the left there with the um, dancing skeletons, the dance of death. And, um, and it, was, it was actually pretty common to show skeletons up and dancing or smiling or something like that. And even though it seems like it's, uh, that's a bit uh, insensitive, perhaps, we have to keep in mind that when people are totally overwhelmed by loss and grief and they stress and they just can't take it anymore, it's a pretty common, uh, or it's pretty common for people to respond to that with humor. Um, they just make fun of it because they, they can't take it anymore. So why not make light of it instead? And um, medieval people do the exact same thing. So we see them making light of all of this. Um, and we also see these depictions there of the plague, of course, affecting every member of society. That's what you're seeing on uh, in the picture to the right. So everyone from clergy members to townsfolks to uh, or members of the aristocracy, everyone is being affected by this. And um, lastly, when it comes to the plague in art, the plague spurs this movement throughout Europe, this cult of remembrance, as it was called, where mostly wealthy people um, thought to themselves, well, I might die of this plague. And if I die, and maybe my whole family dies, I'm going to be forgotten forever. And that is terrifying. I don't want to be forgotten. And so what can I do to um, prevent this? How can I be remembered? And so they decide to start patronizing um, artists and these artists who can paint much more individualistic and realistic paintings uh, tend to garner the, uh, the highest wages here. They're in the most demand. And so, um, so you can probably gather that this uh, trend of patronizing artists, particularly very, very skilled artists who paint realistically, could potentially lead to something like a renaissance. In fact, um, the plague directly leads to the Italian renaissance. So not only because they're patronizing these artists here, but because we have uh, so few laborers and so much labor to be done that people are getting paid more. They have a lot more expendable income and people tend to spend their income on things like, well, fancy stuff to decorate their houses. 
And so we see uh, people investing more in art, investing more in um, literature and things like that. So it's something that's, uh, that spurs the Renaissance in many ways. And the author of the Renaissance, the father of the Renaissance, Petrarch, the person who came up with the idea of a Renaissance, was living, of course, in the middle of the plague. And one of the reasons why he conceptualized this Renaissance, this period of rebirth, is because he thought that the period in which he was actually living was so horrible that maybe, just maybe, at some point in history, it'll get better, all right? People became incredibly um, optimistic after the plague because they thought, surely it's going to get better. There's no way that it could be worse than this. We are living in the absolute worst time in all of human history here. So, it, um, so it, it's encouraging to people ultimately. And, um, and so having said that, once the plague starts to peter out in Western Europe around 1351, 1352, they're not totally done with it. All right, not totally done. That's the biggest wave of the plague, but the plague keeps coming back again and again and again. And interestingly, the plague comes back to Western Europe in 1361, and this plague is called the Children's Plague. Okay, the Children's Plague, which would indicate that people can build up immunity to the plague. So when it comes back in 1361, it's mostly affecting people under the age of um, 13 or so. So it's mostly kids that are dying of this because they, um, because they weren't there for the initial wave of the plague. But the people who lived through that often developed immunity. So each time that the plague comes back after that, and it comes back over and over and over again, um, it kills fewer and fewer and fewer people. And so, um, so we're going to be talking now about um, what happens next. Are we totally done with the plague? What other major outbreaks do we have? And unfortunately here, um, we see another major, major outbreak of plague in London in the 1660s here. So now that I've painted this rosy picture of the Renaissance and thinking that it might be all over again, uh, I just want to take a moment to destroy all of that. So much like the end of a horror movie when Freddy Krueger is dead and you think everything's going to be okay, and then suddenly he opens his eye and winks at you and you know that uh, there's gonna be a sequel. Well, there's gonna be a sequel with the plague here. All right, there's always a sequel with the plague. And one of the worst sequels of the plague, of course, happened in London. Uh, and so in London, uh, or the London outbreak of the plague was one of the worst ones in more modern history because there was just a perfect storm of horrible conditions in London. London was one of the dirtiest cities in all of Europe at this time, keeping in mind that the plague broke out in other cities in Europe in the 1360s, but it was much more deadly uh, in London at this time because of the living conditions. So by the 1360s, London had the population of an early modern city, but had the infrastructure of a medieval city there. So um, basically tenements that are stacked on top one after after another, after another, after another, open sewers all over the place. Um, it's just a nasty, nasty situation. So if a plague were to break out, they basically have no way of stopping it from spreading. And that's exactly what happens in 1665. So they hear of an outbreak in continental Europe and they try their best to close off all the harbors and stop it from heading into the city. But one ship from the Netherlands, a ship full of cotton, manages to get into the harbor and the mice head off the ship there and into the city. And, um, and so the plague breaks out in London there. Anyone who had the means to get the heck out of the city did. 
And um, everyone else who didn't have the means to do that and stayed, uh, many of these people ended up dying. In fact, we see, um, we don't know the exact number of people who died in this outbreak, but somewhere around 7,000 people per day were dying at the height uh, of this plague. But the reason we don't really know the full extent of how many people died in this is because in 1666, a fire broke out in London and just burned the whole place to the ground, burned all of the records of the people who were dying uh, in the plague. So we don't know the numbers uh, behind all of that. And um, ultimately, this fire ended up being a blessing in disguise because the fire in London didn't really kill that many people that we know of because most of the people who could leave had already left the city because of the plague. Um, and, and so it didn't really kill that many people, but what it did do is burn out all of that medieval infrastructure and allow London to kind of start from scratch, rebuild and actually plan their city and do it right this time. And so, um, so again, it ends up being a blessing in disguise ultimately, but tens of thousands, if not more, maybe a hundred thousand people, we aren't totally sure, uh, they ended up dying during this. Not to mention all of the animals that died. And I mentioned this because um, there was a decree at this time that the plague was coming from animals. They didn't know which ones though. So they ordered everyone to kill all of the cats and dogs. And um, that is a crying shame because it wasn't coming from the cats and dogs. It's coming from the rats that the cats and dogs could have killed. Uh, so they made their situation even worse by doing that. And in fact, dogs are resistant to plague bacteria. So um, dogs don't come down with that anyway. Cats are not as resistant to plague bacteria as dogs are, but they aren't typically carriers of it in the way that rats are. So either way, you're making a mistake if you're killing all of the dogs and cats, but that's what they did here. So we have tons of people, tons of animals dying at this time here. And, um, and so now I wanna talk about who might have saved the day and why we don't see another major outbreak in Europe after the Great Plague of London. And it is the most ironic save that you could possibly imagine because, wait for it, we'll see who saved the day here for the Black, uh, the black Death. Uh, it's a rat, a rat saved everyone, which I know, again, this seems incredibly ironic that a rat would save the day here. But um, in the case of uh, the rats here, uh, we see a new species of rat coming down uh, to southern parts of Europe at this time. So typically, the rat that was spreading the plague was the black rat, which you can see uh, in the picture right there. So black rats have a very specific type of flea, and they tend to be, uh, or they tend to carry um, bubonic plague. So it's endemic to these black rat populations there. But sometime in the late uh, 17th century, we start to see the Norwegian brown rat migrating down from Scandinavia and kind of spreading throughout the rest of Europe. And as you can see there, the Norwegian brown rat is larger than the black rat and it was more aggressive than the black rat was. So these Norwegian brown rats not only compete with the black rats there, but they actively kill them, all right? So they kill almost all of these black rats there. And um, the great thing about these Norwegian rats here is that uh, they don't carry plague bacteria. All right, they have a different type of fleas. They have a uh, flea, they have a different, uh, they carry different types of diseases, but they don't typically carry the plague. And so essentially all of Europe could have been saved by a Viking rat, 
All right, so the plague starts with a rat in Europe and then maybe ends with a rat in Europe. And, um, but that's not to say that we're totally done with the plague. There's still a little bit more to come here. So with the last major outbreak of the plague, the third wave of the plague happens between the mid and, uh, or the mid 19th and early 20th century. And this time it breaks out in China, similar to the other instances that we had talked about. And again, similar to the other instances there, it's largely a result, uh, a result of wars that are going on. Uh, so you have things like the Sino-Japanese War that's going on in the 19th century and early 20th century there, and um, displaced populations. So anytime that you have displaced populations, uh, you're much, much more likely to end up with a plague. So the first wave of this plague starts as bubonic plague in the Yunnan province in uh, China and ends up killing about 60 to 80,000 uh, Chinese people. And then later on in the early 20th century, we see another outbreak of plague in Manchuria. And um, this one is unfortunately pneumonic plague. Okay, so we see pneumonic plague breaking out, spreading person to person throughout Manchuria. And then this time it spreads all throughout China and even into India. In fact, India is the hardest hit by this third wave of plague. We see about 12.5 million Indians dying of the plague at this time. And so this is the third wave, but we do see a number of breakthroughs coming through uh, with this third wave of the plague. For starters, microscopes had been invented. All right, so microscopes have been invented, which means that epidemiologists could actually study the plague and see what the heck they were trying to fight here. And so the plague bacteria was uh, discovered simultaneously by um, a Japanese worker and a Swiss uh, scientist. So, but it gets the name uh, of the Swiss scientist, Alexander Yersin, hence Yersinia pestis. So we now know that it's a bacteria. There was also the belief that this plague, the second wave of the third wave here, uh, the pneumonic plague was spread through the air from breathing on people. And so they start a mask initiative in China, which I know we are sick of hearing about mask initiatives and the people who fight against it and all of that. I know we've had our fill of that, but that's what they start in China at this time. They're encouraging people to wear masks to try to contain the plague and it largely works. Um, so not only are we seeing the widespread use of masks, we're also seeing the development of much more modern PPE uh, and the predecessors to hazmat suits, which is what you're seeing right there. They also discover that you can inoculate uh, people against the plague. So that goes along with the idea that people can develop immunities uh, to it. So you can take weakened plague bacteria and start inoculating people with it, which is what you're seeing in the bottom picture there. Um, you have a doctor who is inoculating a patient uh, in India uh, from the plague. And so the third wave is the last major wave of the plague that we see, and we learn a lot along the way. But that doesn't mean that, again, we're totally done with all of this. We've also had some more modern outbreaks of the plague here. Uh, so, for example, very, very recently, there was an outbreak in Madagascar. So an outbreak in 2013, and I believe another outbreak in 2017, 2018 or so. And um, we also see sort of sporadic instances of people coming down with the plague very recently, as in, in the last probably few months or so, you might've seen on CNN that um, there have been cases of plague in Mongolia where people have eaten the livers of uh, marmots. So that cutesy little chubby creature that we talked about in a previous uh, presentation. Um, so people have come down with the plague there. We also have outbreaks of the plague uh, or rather instances of the plague in the United States. As you can see in that map, the U.S. actually has a ton of plague when it comes to uh, plague being endemic to rodent populations. We're fortunate in that most of us 
who are listening to this lecture right now um, are living on the East Coast. Okay, so most of us are on the East Coast. Our plague is mostly in uh, the West and uh, kind of central areas of the United States. And the rodents that we see um, more often than not carrying the plague is the prairie dog, at least in the United States. So prairie dogs have boatloads of plague. And if you ever go to the American West, Southwest, Pacific Northwest, anywhere in that area, if you ever see a prairie dog, never pick one up. Uh, so they may very well have the plague. And we've seen some instances of people in the United States coming down with it. Just a couple of years ago, a little boy in Idaho came down with the plague. Um, and he lived through it. He had to go to the hospital and um, receive an IV of antibiotics for about three weeks or so. And it was touch and go at times, but he ended up living through it. And that is the case with most people who come down with bubonic plague in developed nations. So usually we're able to treat them for that. But when people get pneumonic plague, we still can't really treat them very well. We have an instance of this, uh, even in the United States in 2007, there was a zoologist who decided to go into the Grand Canyon and do a necropsy on a mountain lion. And he didn't have proper PPE and he actually breathed in plague bacteria. And when he breathed it in, it basically manifested itself in pneumonic plague. And even though he was brought to the hospital, it just spread so quickly and is so devastating that even our antibiotics, uh, like our IV drips can't treat that. Um, so, um, so we do at least have some solutions to all of this at this point. Uh, speaking of which, I want to talk about these modern treatments for the plague. So um, the man that you see in the picture there to the left is, of course, Alexander Fleming. And in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And so we now have antibiotics uh, to treat the plague here. And so it makes you kind of breathe a sigh of relief that there's light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, and it's definitely an improvement. I mean, we're living in the first full century where we can actually treat the plague effectively. Um, but there are still some concerns, particularly concerns about antibiotic resistance, um, that overuse of antibiotics in livestock, in hand sanitizers and soaps and all sorts of things, or people being prescribed antibiotics when they don't actually need an antibiotic. This all leads to problems of antibiotic resistance and could potentially lead to a post-antibiotic uh, era. And if that ever happens, and then the plague breaks out again, we're going to have problems. And the plague has shown that um, it can sit and wait for a little while. Because if we look at the first outbreak with the Justinianic plague and the amount of time between that outbreak and the Black Death, we're talking about 800 years that it waited around. If we look at the span of time from, uh, say, the one in the, uh, the 1660s there to now, we're talking about over three centuries that the plague has waited. And so, um, so that's something that kind of gives you chills and um, keeps you up at night thinking that it's always possible for it to break out again. But of course, in this modern day and age, it's not really the plague uh, currently that we are most concerned with. I mean, clearly it's coronavirus right now. And um, when I originally wrote this lecture a few years ago when I delivered it, I had mentioned that, uh, that there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel because in this modern day and age, while we are much more connected to one another, so a plague could spread much, much faster, we are also able to communicate much better with one another, warn each other about plague outbreaks and work together in coming up with a solution, which is again, something that we're seeing with coronavirus right now. It spreads incredibly quickly because of air travel and how interconnected all uh, we all are. But at the same time, we have all of the best of the best scientists from all over the globe working together to try to fix this situation. And as of today, most recently, 
Pfizer has developed a vaccine that is 90% effective. And so that's incredibly promising here. And, um, and so on that very promising note, uh, I'll end the lecture and I can spend a few minutes here uh, answering some questions. I know there were some in the chat along the way, uh, but if you have any questions, I'll work on, uh, I'll work on that. And um, let's see. Oh, and I had a question about um, the Mongols spreading the plague and why weren't their armies decimated along with their victims? Their armies were decimated uh, along with their victims. So they absolutely fell victim to this as well. Um, and let's see. Uh, oh, and I had a question about if they blamed the pets for the plague because pets could carry fleas around. And um, that's a possibility. So like I said, they thought that it could come from um, animals, but they weren't sure which ones uh, it was coming from. And um, then let's see. I, oh, you had mentioned the Mongols damage the very features of the Silk Road. Uh, and yeah, they, they did. Actually, the plague almost directly led to the end of the Mongol Empire and fewer trade connections uh, throughout Asia, uh, into the Middle East and Europe. So in many ways, the plague destroyed uh, many of the facets of the Silk Road there. And um, let's see. And Oh, and one of you had mentioned that you grew up around a grassy mound in a local park that was a plague pit. And those plague pits are where we've actually gotten a lot of information about this plague bacteria. So some very brave archaeologists, epidemiologists have jumped into those things and harvested uh, tooth pulp from plague victims to study all of that and see what was going on. So who knows, maybe that very plague pit was one of them that helped them uh, discover this. And um, let's see, oh, and you had asked about what could make people less susceptible to the plague. And one of the things that would make you less susceptible to the plague is of course, being healthy. I know that sounds like a given, but if you are not suffering from comorbidities uh, there, if you don't have underlying conditions, if you eat well um, and you are in good general health, you are slightly less likely to come down with the plague. And as I said, being wealthy often aids in all of that. Uh, and during the Middle Ages and even now, it seems to aid in that. Um, but for the most part, though, all factors considered, technically everyone could have gotten the plague at the time. So technically everyone. Um, and now um, the imposed restrictions uh, that you're referring to in the sumptuary laws there, you mentioned, do they apply to the wealthy or just the newly rich here? Um, that's a good question. They only apply to the peasantry. So people who were previously in a lower class and are trying to put on airs and make themselves look like members of the nobility. It only applies to them. Uh, and uh, let's see. So, um, oh, and how I had a question about how universal throughout Europe were the prohibitions about peasants uh, owning property. Um, and we know for a fact that this was going on in England at the time and throughout the rest of Europe, it just depends on a given uh, state or given kingdom because during the Middle Ages, European states were not unified in the same way that they are now. Uh, that unification process really starts to congeal in the 19th century. So it could really vary from individual kingdoms there. Uh, and um, so uh, let's see, I had another question there about the Pied Piper uh, being about rats and not about uh, dogs and cats there. So, um, so yeah, that uh, it's worth mentioning that with the outbreak of the plague in, uh, in London, that it, it extended to um, dogs, cats, 
rats, any animals. But what was probably the most traumatic for the people there was having to kill their own pets. So that's what we hear people talking about, having to kill their own pets there. So we see that uh, popping up more and more in our sources. And, um, and so uh, let's see, I had a question there about the Mongols, one of the few empires in history that rose and fell twice. So yeah, that's, that's a good point there. So rose and fell twice and the largest contiguous empire in all of history. And, um, and so, it, you would also mention how does it that it now seems to be viruses instead of bacteria that are much more rampant. And the quick answer to that is that we have antibiotics that can treat uh, bacteria, or at least most bacteria we're able to treat with antibiotics, whereas viruses are a little bit more tricky. As we have seen uh, as of late with coronavirus, it's hard to treat a virus. It's a lot easier to prevent a virus with a vaccine or something like that, uh, just because of the way that viruses work. So you can think of a virus as entering into your cells and then taking over all of the controls of your cells and using your cells against you, whereas bacteria typically tend to attack your cells, all right? They're attacking your cells. So you can kill bacteria and get rid of them and then save your nice healthy cells there. Viruses are trickier because they've taken over your cells. So you have to kind of tread lightly so you're not destroying the person in the process of treating the virus there. Uh, and so, um, oh, and I had a question about uh, medieval people uh, use moldy bread to fly, uh, fight the plague. So moldy bread, could potentially help with that if um, we're talking about the type of mold uh, from which we get penicillin. Um, but I haven't seen any uh, any or sources or primary sources from the time that suggest that. Um, but it's possible. It's absolutely possible that some enterprising uh, peasants might have done that, and it could have been effective potentially. And um, and so. Uh, and, oh, and I had a question about the, uh, wouldn't the Scandinavian rats have come down with the plague uh, if they were killing these black rats there? And that's a good question. You'd think that it would have been passed from one to another, but for whatever reason, these big Viking rats there were resistant to the plague. And so we don't think that most of them were coming down with it. Uh, and um, so it ended up working out, which this is only one theory behind why the plague doesn't come back. Uh, the one thing we're certain of is that it was some sort of freak natural phenomenon that caused the plague to not come back in the uh, after the 17th century, because it certainly wasn't people being better about it because we were still pretty dirty after all of that. Um, we still didn't learn our lessons in most of the major cities in Europe, so it probably was some sort of freak natural phenomenon there. Uh, and oh, and I had a question about um, whether I am teaching next semester and Maybe, uh, it, it's possible. I usually do an Ollie lecture um, every, either every semester or at least a couple of times a year or so. So, uh, so if folks reach out to me and give me a theme of some sort, I would be happy to do another lecture. So thank you all for uh, attending the class here and um, for all of your great questions along the way. So it's been a lot of fun and again, very pertinent to what's going on right now. And um, so I think I've gotten all of the questions in the chat at this point. I, I think I have. Uh, and I'm running out of time and I know another class is going to be starting soon. So, so again, thank you all for coming out and hopefully I will see you uh, in another semester.